All right, so I got a, a slightly different sermon this morning, but in Revelation chapter 13, let's start off by saying, you know, I believe the Bible. I believe every single word of the Bible. I believe it's preserved for us today. I believe it's true. I believe it's accurate. I don't think there's any problems or errors in, within the Bible. And what we're reading here in Revelation 13 is a prophecy of future events. Now, as with many people throughout history, I think that these future events are very shortly going to come to pass and are, and are upon us. Now, granted, there's been many people all throughout history have kind of felt and thought the same thing. But so do I. <laughs> I think that even so much more today. And there's so many reasons why. You look at the technology, you look at the, the prophecies, and you're starting to see how these things can be fulfilled realistically. You know, when you, when you look at, like it says here in Revelation 13, it's talking about the Antichrist setting up a one-world government. Now, now look, Revelation 13, uh, you know, you read the whole book of Revelation, but specifically here in Revelation 13, the thing I'm about to say, people will look at you today, many people, not everyone, there's a lot of people waking up to this truth, but many people look at you and be like, what are you, some conspiracy nut? What are you, some kook? Oh, you believe in this one-world government and these you know, globalists? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Not only can you see the evidence just happening around you politically and you can see it in the news, but the Bible prophesies this. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you better believe that there is an evil agenda, that there is a, an antichrist that is going to come, that is going to rule the world, that all the, the nations that have power at that time are going to rel relinquish their power unto the beast. He is going to have total authority. And he's going to set up a system where it is impossible for people to buy, to sell. I mean, you won't be able to go to the supermarket and buy food. You won't be able to go out and buy clothing. You won't be able to conduct commerce unless you take that mark of the beast. As the Bible says, in your right hand or in your forehead. And again, one of the, one of the reasons why it appears that, that the, the, time, the end times are, are becoming upon us so much quicker is because... All throughout history, it's going to be a lot more difficult to see how you could implement, well, how could nobody buy or sell? There's always been black markets. There's always been you know, underground bartering and things like that. But with the technology these days of being able to force people, first of all, being able to spy on everybody, and second of all, having you know, what might very well be an implantable chip, like an RFID or something similar to that, to be able to just say, hey, this is the only way that you can purchase. You can see we're already moving to a cashless society. So it's not, it's not physical transactions being made anymore. The, 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 the system is being set up in order to allow for this type of, of prophetic event to come to pass. We know it's going to happen. There is no way around it. But that doesn't mean that we just throw up our hands and give up and say, well, whatever, let it know. We still fight. We still fight against the evil. We still fight for the good. And the title of my sermon this morning is How to Fight the New World Order. Because the New World Order is a phrase that has been around now for a little while. And thankfully, with, with the internet and, and with the freer flow of information, there's a lot more people that are able to get this knowledge. And it's not quite as hidden as it used to be. Now, there's always these plans. You know, the people who are in charge, the, the, the people behind the New World Order, are always out trying to censor and limit the information that you get and, and to keep the people docile and, and not aware and ignorant of what's going on. Because when a people is ignorant, I mean, you, don't, you just don't know. You don't know what's going on. You don't know that there's evil plans. You don't know that these things are going on. And people have a tendency to just say, to, to think that other people are like yourself. And I've warned about this many times in the past. I just preached a sermon two weeks ago called Beware of Dogs. There are evil people in this world that do not think the way that you think. It's easy to just to, to kind of blow off when someone does something. But, you know, oh, well, you know, youth rationalize and think about if you were in that situation, how could you have maybe done something like that? And, and you see more of the good in people because you see them more as yourself. But there are people that are 
wicked, evil, bad people who literally plot and plan and conspire to do bad things to other people. Granted, they do have their own motivation, whether it be for money or power or whatever, but they don't care about other people the way that you care about other people. And we, first of all, need to realize that these people exist. And just, just knowing that, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's evident though. You know that these people exist. It's not something you want to think about. Look at the serial killers and the perverts and the pedophiles and these people who do this stuff. I can't grasp why they would do those things. They're sick in the head. They're, they're, they're not right. They're wicked. They're evil people. But it's not just them. There's other evil people that, that have higher positions of power. See, the people I just mentioned, I mean, they can just be anybody, right? But there are people that are, that are in positions of political power, of financial power, that are in this world, that actually have the ability to, to, to do a lot of damage to people, that, are, um, that have evil plans. Basically, that's the way it is. You know, the, the New World Order is something that's been alluded to. You know, there's a lot of secret societies that are set up that, that people are only even able to attain these, uh, these levels of power within government because they go through all these secret societies. They make the right friendships. They network. They get, you know, blackmailed or whatever. They have people that know all about their life and end up becoming puppets because they're controlled because they have some nasty secret in their closet that they don't want being exposed and they want to continue in power and that's the way the game is played now the power structure has been set up for a very long time and i just want to point this out here in revelation 3 we started here just so that you could you could realize that this isn't nuts this isn't just some kooky thing when you hear about things like the new world order because the Bible has it, has it listed out here, and I didn't, I, you know, I mentioned it, but let's just look at some of the verses specifically. Verse number seven says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. The saints, by the way, are believers. They're people who are sanctified in Jesus Christ. So this is a war that is going to face believers in Jesus Christ. It's coming up in the future. And to overcome them. It's going to be a losing battle. Now, in the end, we know who wins. Praise God for that. But, the, this is, and this is the great tribulation. This is the tribulation that's to come against the believers. That we are going to be facing trials and tribulations because the Antichrist is going to be making war against us. And to overcome them. It says, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. He has power over everybody. Over the whole world. Global power, one world government is what he's going to have the power. I mean, this is what the Bible says. Not mincing any words, not, not, not twisting the meaning. That's what it says. There is going to be a one world government of the, with the Antichrist is going to be in charge and he's going to make war against the saints, against the believers in Jesus Christ. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the life of of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So people, who, all the unbelievers, are basically going to be worshiping the beast. And we see from other places, you look at Matthew 24, and you look at other places in Revelation, how <coughs> there's going to be these great miracles done and wonders so that people are going to be believing it just because they're going to see these, these miracles being done by the Antichrist. And they're just going to, going to believe what their eyes are telling them instead of having true faith in Jesus Christ. See, having faith in Jesus Christ, we don't see that. We don't see any of that today. We, we, we have to take it by faith, by hearing God's word. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But there's going to be a lot of people that follow the Antichrist because they see the miracles he performs and they're just going to hold, just, just follow him, get sucked right into his deception and they're going to take the mark of the beast. And the Bible says in Revelation 14 that the people that take the mark of the beast... They're going to hell. They, their fate is sealed. And um, all the more reason why we need to be proclaiming the truth from the housetops that this is coming so that people could be aware of this, so that people can know about it before it happens so that they don't end up going down and taking that mark of the beast. 
so that they don't go, you know, the unbelievers, what I'm talking about, no believer is going to be deceived by them. Matthew 24 says, and as much as if it were possible that the elect also might be, you know, that they might deceive the, the very elect, but it's not possible for, for the saved to be deceived by the Antichrist. So he's going to set up this one world government. That's what the Bible says here. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Look, listen, this is, this is an, important, an important prophecy that we need to make sure that we're aware of. It says, um, then of course, near the end of the chapter, not only is it one world government, but he says in verse 16, and he causeth all, both small and, rich, or small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. That's a one currency. That's one way to exchange, to, to, to transact economically. One world government, one world currency. Both of those things are in the plans in this new world order, and it's being set up today. Again, as you see the, the decline from using cash, coin, all that stuff, and just going to a credit-based system, just numbers in a computer somewhere, which soon the credit cards is going to be done away with something that's just implanted on, in your body. And that will be a requirement then to do any type of business, any type of transactions. Now, evil forces have been at work for a very long time. This power structure has been in place for a long time. So who's behind the New World Order? Well, some people will say there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of different people will take different stances. Some people say, well, it's the rich bankers. It's Israel, it's the Catholic Church, it's the Illuminati. Now, I believe that all of these are players in the, ultimate, in the game. But I don't believe that any of them are the source behind the whole thing. Because what's happening here, what's being set up, is very cleverly and carefully orchestrated. There is a master designer behind this plan. It's not just... The result of the hearts of wicked men that is bringing this to pass, it is ultimately the design of Satan himself. He is the one behind it. This is why, because and this is something as I started learning more about some of these things, you hear about the Rothschilds and and you know just other families that, that have been kind of involved in, in in wickedness and in these secret societies and stuff, and say, well, how can it really pass from generation to generation? I mean. Every child, you, you have your own choice to make as you're growing up, right? And I'm thinking, how could that really be part of the family dynasty or whatever? And, and then continue and have the foresight from 100 years ago to make the plans that they're even making now. But the reason why the foresight was there is because the foresight's from Satan. He's the master designer behind the whole plan. And it's important to make sure that we understand that that's where it's coming from. So when people call you, and, that, and that's another reason why uh, you know, some people will, will claim that you don't have credibility. Well, how can, it, how can you be you know, orchestrating this whole thing? Because in order to have a conspiracy, people need to, to be knowing about it and have it all planned out in advance. And they'll look at some of these groups and say, you know, these groups, they don't care about the other groups. You know, the Catholic Church doesn't care about the Illuminati or whatever, you know. Look, I don't, I'm not going to fight the details, but you know what I'm saying. You know, all these various little groups that you say that are, that are ultimately playing into a one world government, the new world order, and, and that all individually can be very evil of themselves. They don't necessarily have this great fellowship amongst each other. They're kind of like dogs. They'll go out, you know, in their dog eat dog world. They're going to go after each other also. But what they have, they have the common denominator is Satan that is, that is manipulating them as puppets of his own to do the things that he wants to have done to bring this new world order in full swing. So the reason why it's important to understand who's behind it all is because if we're going to fight the new world order, we need to know where to direct our attention to. It's a spiritual battle that we're fighting. It is not, it, it's not going to do any good to, to, to try to go after one of, the, one of the puppets. Right? Because you've got this whole other part of the body there. And people, get, people could get overwhelmed and say, well, what can I do? You know, how can I go after the Illuminati? Well, you don't have to go after the Illuminati. 
What you do is we go after Satan, we go after his major plan, and we're going to get into that from Scripture. See, all of this is, is given to us from Scripture. And what we need to deal with and do the fight is biblically. This isn't just people that we have to fight of, of them coming up with things on their own. If it were, then you would fight that one individual battle based on, on what they're doing. This is a much grander scheme. And it's already been prophesied in the Bible. If God is telling us about this, let's then go to this book to learn how to fight it. Instead of following, because here's the thing. There's a lot of people out there, good meaning people, well-intentioned people, people bringing good information forth. I mean, you look at like the InfoWars and the We Are Change groups and there's all, the, all these other places online you can get information about the secret societies and, and people who have exposed and uncovered all this truth and showing all these different politicians who are, who are in bed together and they are doing these things and they're wicked and they're and they're they're sodomite pasts and, and all of these things right all this truth comes to the surface but a lot of times they fall short in their method of attack because they're not going to the ultimate truth and the ultimate wisdom that we need to know how to engage in this battle now if you have any doubts that Satan is behind this, look at what he did to Job. If you can remember the story of Job in chapters 1 and 2, Satan is the one who attacked Job. Satan's the one, first of all, that, that was bad-mouthing him to God. God's the one that was bragging on Job, saying, hey, look, Job's a great guy. Look, Job has integrity. Look, hey, Job is serving me. What a great guy. You know, he is, he is doing pretty much what I can expect out of a person to be doing here on earth. Look at Job. What a great example of a person. And Satan's like, yeah, well, that's just because you're protecting him and all this other stuff. So, you know, the, as the story goes, God allows him to, to, to do some things to Job, but, he, you know, not to kill him. Not, you know, there's, there's certain limits that God places on what Satan's allowed to do. Now, that doesn't mean God was doing those things. Satan was doing those things. He was the enemy. He was the one that brought all the pain and the hardship on Job. God didn't do it. He just allowed it to happen. There's a different, there's a big difference there. And if you remember what Job, what Satan orchestrated against Job, he made it look like God was coming down on him. He made he orchestrated for Job to receive the news from all different ends consecutively, one after the other, after the other, after the other, all on the same day. All of these tragedies happened to him. And, you know, the Bible, of course, says, while he was yet speaking, behold, this other guy came up. And he's just telling him how, you know, all of his goods, all of his animals have been destroyed, have been taken captive, and his servants are dead. And it's just one after the other after the other, all the way up until your children were all in one house. And this big whirlwind came. And the root in the house collapsed on him. And they're all dead. So I'm the only one left that made it out. All those people were like, I'm the only one that made it out. Satan made it so that all of these events happen in different places. I'm sure they had to have been different distances away, but he was able to calculate it so that the person, the one person out of all of those tragedies, as they left, was able to make it to Job so that he just got hit, 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 hit. One after the other really quickly in rapid succession. Satan has some wisdom. He's got some power for sure to make something like that happen. And in, in one of the events too, it said fire came down from heaven. That's what, the, that's what the guy said. Making it look like, well, who can do that but God, right? Making you think it's God doing it. That was the devil doing that. So when you see in Scripture the way that he's able to make the, you know, orchestrate and plan these things, it's no surprise that, that he's behind something even greater and grander of, ultimate, and of his ultimate desire to sit in the temple of God as God himself and proclaiming himself to be God and just saying, hey, everybody worship me. Because that was the intent of Satan from the beginning anyways. 
He wants to be like the Most High. He wants to be like God. And his end game, his plan is to ultimately just have the whole world worship and serve him. He wants to replace God. That's why he makes war with the saints. He wants all of the believers in Christ exterminated because he knows they're never going to worship him. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel, when, when they were told to bow down and to worship at the golden image, they said, look, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. You know, you can play your stupid music, but guess what? We're not going to bow down to that image. We're not going to do it because they were believers. And they had integrity. They knew that that was wrong. There's no way they're going to bow down the image. And Satan knows that, that believers in Christ, there's no way they're going to take the mark of the beast. There's no way they're going to worship him. So the only option he has left is to just destroy him and kill him. He says, okay, I'll kill you guys. Everyone else will worship me. And then he'll have the whole world worshiping him. That's his plan. Now his plan is going to be foiled by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's going to come down and destroy him. Thank God. But he's, this is what he's doing. I mean, we, the, the history is already written in this book. We could see it. But, it, but we're living it out. And it's going to happen. Now, the Bible even says in, in Ezekiel 28.3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee in, refer, in reference to Satan. He's wiser than Daniel. I mean, think about it. Satan has been around since the Garden of Eden. And think about the wisdom that you have and that you gain in the, in the years and the decades that you live. And you just, you just you know, gain more knowledge. It's just through experience, through many, many avenues, you just gain more and more knowledge. Satan's been around for about 6,000 years now. It's a long time. Know, uh, know the enemy. He's not someone that we could take on individually just, just of our own power. But we need to know who he is. We need to know how to fight it. Now, a lot of people get, get mixed up in, in the wrong battle, as I mentioned earlier. I almost did this, and I thank God that I didn't. Because a lot of people look to politics as being the answer. They'll say, you know, well, what do we do? How do we fight this new world order? Do we, do we campaign for our favorite candidate? You know, do we, do we go get Donald Trump signs and, and say, yeah, he's going to save us from everything? No. No, politics isn't going to save us. Okay, don't look to a man to save you from the spiritual battle that we have to face. Honestly, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all. But what we need to understand with the political process, because look, I was, I, I was thinking about, okay, well, if there's no one out there, then maybe I'll just run for political office. I'll do this. But the game is rigged. It's rigged. First of all, they rig it so that the people who actually do have integrity that would, that would try to do something good, you're never going to get in because the, the, the political insiders. And you see it now. And look, I'll, I'm going to start off right off the bat. I am not a Donald Trump fan. I'm not an anyone fan that's running right now for, for office at all. I think they're all jokes and that none of them are Christian and that none of them are, are out to... to set up or, or have any type of establishment of a biblically type based system of government at all. But what's funny is that you see these guys that he is saying things that the establishment, that the people who are in power right now don't like. And unfortunately, that's why a lot of people are jumping on his bandwagon is because he's saying some of these things. But I mean, when you look at the guy, he's an authoritarian. He wants to have this huge marriage. He wants to be the police of the world. He wants to dictate and tell other people what to do. And he wants to come in and, and he says, I'm going to make everything better. How are you going to do that? By taking power over everything? I mean, he doesn't have the mind of a servant, which is, you know, the leader ought to have. Not an authoritarian. The authoritarian is going to come in and take away your rights and take away your freedom and say, this is what you need to do because I say that that's what you need to do. That's what's best for you. And when people start dictating, this is what you have to do because this is what's best for you. I know better than you do. That's when you lose all your freedom. That's what they want to do with the guns. Well, you, you, can't be, you, can't, uh, you can't be responsible. You can't own your own guns. We've got to take those away from you. They hurt people. There's people out there that do bad things, so we just have to, you just can't be trusted with it. You're like little kids. So it's called the nanny state. It's true. It's because the, the government and people get in charge 
And they get this, this, this complex where they think that they know better than everybody else and they're going to dictate to everyone else what to do. The problem is they're dealing with adults. You're not dealing with little children. But they feel like they are. So we got we to take care of these people. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to steal from this person and give it to that person. It's all a bunch of nonsense. We don't fight it by the, by the politics, by running for political office. Don't get caught up in that trap. You're just going to end up spinning your wheels. You may have a good heart, you may have a good desire, a good motive, but that's not the way to win this battle. So let's look at how to win this battle. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because what Satan's going to try to do, he's going to try to set up all these false choices for you. He knows. He knows that people are going to resist him and try to fight him. And in all the wisdom that he has, he's going to try to make it so that you end up wasting your time. He'll try to get you involved in all the politics of things. And that's why we even have this, this, this two-party system of government. The Republicans and the Democrats. And it's this left-right paradigm. And, and, and it, what it does is it, it, forces you, it forces the people to think that, well, I only have two choices. I'm either Republican or Democrat. That's it. That's false. You have other choices. Look, they're both wrong. They're both bad. Okay? Now, and you know what? You know how that's proven? I know they say all these different things. We've had Republican and Democrat presidents. What has changed? Who has done anything different when you've had either a Republican or a Democrat in office, really, in the past two decades? They all build the government bigger. They all say, oh, the Republicans say, we want a smaller government. And then they expand the government like, you know, like Ronald Reagan did. You know, the, 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 the favorite conservative, everybody's favorite Republican. Look at how much he expanded government. Bush did the same. Remember, no new taxes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Liar. Just like all of them. They expand the government. None of them, you know, they, they, they say one thing and they do another. And when you, you, the way you know that, that they both, they're all, they're all part of the same system, regardless of what they say. They say things to get people divided and to get people, they, oh yeah, this is who I want to support. This is what... But when it actually comes to action, they all do the same thing. Ultimately, they're all puppets. Anyone that gets to office thinking that they're going to make a change and do something and that has integrity, once they get in, they're going to realize how the game's really played. And then you're going to play ball or else you're going to have problems. And that's what goes on. But let's look at how we deal with this because... Look into a man, look into Donald Trump, look into Ted Cruz, look into, God forbid, Bernie Sanders. Man, I don't know what people have a problem looking at history that, that think that socialism is the answer. But <coughs> that's not where we're going to find our solution. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to find the, the answers in the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Robert, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Another warning to us. In the last days, which I believe we're in, perilous, troublous, troubling times are going to come. We need to be prepared for this. <laughs> for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. These are all of these attributes of people that are going to be around in the last days, which is why there's going to be perilous times, because people are going to be covetous. They're going to be wanting things that they can't get and that don't belong to them. The, uh, the being traitors, right? People will stab you in the back. False accusers without natural affection. Look at the rise of the sodomites, the homosexuals. That's what that means. They have not natural affection. It's not natural. It's not the way God designed us. A man with a man or a woman with a woman. That is not the way it designed it. 
unholy, incontinent, pure, you know, all these all these different attributes, they're going to be surging and becoming more and more and more prevalent in the world, which is why you're going to see crime increase. You're going to see a lot less safety. You know, In my series I'm going into tonight on old-fashioned values, I'm comparing the, the time period of the 1950s to today. It's a whole other world. People used to be able to have their doors unlocked and not even worry about it and walk right in. And, you know, it, it's, it's a completely different world. Why? Because there's more and more wickedness abounding because people are becoming more and more like we see here in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. Many other reasons, but I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's way different. And this is where we're spiraling out of control with the sin, with the sin problem in this country. Let's keep reading here because we're, he's, he's warning us of these last days. So in the warning, he's going to help us to know, hey, what can we do about it? It's not enough just to understand, okay, this is the problem. It's, that's the first step. We need to know it's coming. We need to be prepared for it. But how do we fight it? How do we, how do we deal with this? The end of verse 5, he says, from such turn away. So have nothing to do with those people, first of all. Turn away from them. Don't allow them to influence you. And to drag you down with them. Verse number six. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This goes into that reprobate doctrine. Look, they can learn all they want. These, these people, this is, all these attributes are describing rep- reprobates. You look at Romans 1, it's the same thing. It's similar lists of, of attributes. These people are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's impossible for them because they've been rejected. And it says so in verse 8. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. That word reprobate means rejected. These people are rejected concerning the faith. God has denied them. He has rejected them. Why? Because they rejected him. They denied God. They rejected God. They will have nothing to do with them. Now he's given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient and their minds are corrupt. These are the people that we're dealing with that have the wicked plans. It's these wicked reprobates that hate God that will have nothing to do with them and are ultimately serving the devil. They're serving Satan. Verse number 9. But they shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now look, Paul's listing off these things to Timothy. Just after he's warning him, look, there's these people out there, the reprobates, and there's been reprobates all throughout history. People who are wicked, evil people all throughout history. Whether we're dealing with them today or whether we were dealing with them back in Paul's day, he's saying, look, these people exist. These are their attributes. Turn away from them. He says, but you know how I dealt with it. You know my doctrine. You know my manner of life, the way that I do things. You know my purpose and my faith and my long suffering, my charity, my patience. Verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Again, another warning. saying, Look, it's not that every Christian is going to suffer persecution. He says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. It's not enough just to be a believer. But if you're a believer and you're living godly, that's when you're going to suffer the persecution. When you're actually... See, the devil doesn't want to attack you if you're not doing anything for God anyways. If you're not withstanding him, if you're not opposing him or doing anything to, to, to promote Christ, then why would he have to attack you? You can be saved. You can put, you, your faith could be in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you just sit back and do nothing and you're not doing anything for the cause at all... You won't get attacked. But as soon as you start making an impact, as soon as you start reaching other people, they'll go, oh, wait, stop that. We can't have that going on. That's when the attacks are going to come. And the Bible promises it right here. He says, look, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you say, well, I'm not suffering persecution. Are you living godly for Christ Jesus? You just ask yourself that question. 
Verse number 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to get worse. But continue thou, see, even though that's happening, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. So he's saying, look, you need to continue in the things that you know from the Bible. This is the way you deal with those wicked people. Continue and remain steadfast. Don't get distracted with other battles and and, and other ways of dealing with it. He says, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Truly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is going to tell you the instruction that you need to get the good works that you need to be doing with your life in order to combat the evil in this world. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read for you from Philippians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 6 is where you're turning. In Philippians 2, verse 13, the Bible reads, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We are in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. It's wicked. It's perverted. But we need to shine forth as the lights, bearing the light of the truth. It says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Ephesians chapter 6 is going to be the last place we turn to this morning. Ephesians 6 is going to give us the best ideas of what we need to be doing to serve God. You know, right now I've been relatively generic in saying, well, you need to get your instruction from the Bible. What does that mean specifically? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're going to tell us what that armor is. We need to have armor. We need to be protected. We're going out into a spiritual battle. We can't be running out there naked. You're just going to get killed right off the bat. We need to be going out there prepared. We need to have our defenses up in order to withstand this battle. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical battle that we have to fight. Thankfully for many of us, you know, like, I'm not in that great a shape. I don't want to be in a, in, a, in, a, in a physical battle, right? But are you in good shape spiritually? That's the most important question because if you're not, I mean, just, just as much as if you're not in good shape to fight a physical battle, most people are like, completely out of shape when it comes to their spiritual life. We need to make sure, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible tells us this exists. I'm not just some fanatic, some kook saying, oh man, there's these you know, evil people in, in political power. What is he just saying here? The rulers of the darkness of this world. There's people ruling the darkness of the evil of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Places of authority. These people are out there. They have agendas. They have plans to bring evil upon people. So because of this, because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, because there's this spiritual wickedness in high places, verse 13, wherefore, which means because of this, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, because the evil day is going to come. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore, now let's look at the armor. Having your loins girt about with truth. (coughs) 
So the first thing he mentions here, look, we need to have the truth. And where else are you going to find the truth than in this book? God's word is truth. Now, I read a lot of things online. A lot. I I, I get all kinds of different sources of information. I don't know that what I read is truth. I am reading what somebody else wrote. You could read a history book. How do you know that what you're reading is truth? Think about that. Even if our own, just think about, think about reading a book about George Washington, right? You say, well, what's the big deal about George? There's not a big deal about George Washington. Just saying, this is, this is hundreds of years ago, a man that lived. Whatever you're reading is a book that someone else wrote. Their perspective, the way that they see things, the, you know, whatever they're choosing to include as information. Is it true? Don't know. Not necessarily a lie, right? I, I, I'm not saying that, that if you read a book about George Washington, it's a lie. I'm just saying, how can you know for sure that that's the truth? But what we have, we know is the truth. We know we have God's word today. If God has preserved it for us today, we know that we have his word that's the truth. This is what we need to gird our loins about with truth. Now, if you have the truth, you're not going to be deceived or tricked. It's one of the reasons why it's one of the important parts of the armor. We need to to get our minds into God's word and to study and to know the truth. Just even reading like we did in Revelation, knowing these things are going to happen, knowing that they exist will help you with your worldview on how you perceive everything else happening around us. And you'll be able to see through the deception and the lies. Because Satan's a big con man. He's a big deceiver. Just like with all sin, it looks great. right? He paints this picture that makes it look really nice and good. But when you actually get into it, it's, it's death. And it's horrible. And it's miserable. You know, you look at the, the ads for, for the booze, right? Oh, it looks like a great time. Everyone's having fun. Everyone's playing games. Everyone's smiling and laughing. It's all kinds of fun. Uh, then you really get into it, and it's not as fun as, as, as it's supposed to be. You have that fun for a little bit of time, and then you get the hangover, and then you get the problems, and then you get fired from work because you, you can't make it on time, and then you lose, you know, whatever. It causes all kinds of extra problems, right? All sin. That's just one. You get fornication. You, get, you, know, whatever. you can keep on going on down the list. Oh, it looks real great at first. Adultery. Wow, looks great. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun with that person. And then your marriage is destroyed. You lose your children. You lose your family. You lose your house. You lose everything. But if we have the truth, we have the instructions, God's word, we won't fall for the, for the illusion. You shouldn't. At least you'd be better prepared. You, you, you know, if you go into, if, if someone like me were to go into adultery, I know what God says about it. I know all the all the ramifications. So there's no excuse for that. That would just me being really stupid, like a dumb animal, just going forward to my destruction because I know better than that. And that's not going to happen. But I'm just saying that's like, you know, when you have the truth, it's going to be a lot harder to be deceived. But let's keep on reading the armor. In verse 14, loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. What's righteous? Doing, being right. Doing, doing the right things. Living a godly life. The breastplate, that's, I mean, that's a big part of your defense. Right? Living a godly, righteous life. A life where you're getting the sin out of your life and doing things right by God. When, you, when you're living your life that way, that is, that is a big part of your armor. Because... There's going to be a, you'll, you'll have a lot more impact, for one. People will be able to believe your testimony. You know, for example, when, when I was, I got saved when I was 20 years old. For a long time after that, I didn't live for Christ. I didn't do, you know, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't even really reading my Bible. I still like to go out and party and drink and do all these other things. Every once in a while, a subject of the Bible or God would come up. I would be ashamed. I wouldn't say anything at all. Because I would look at myself and be like, well, why would anyone listen to me? I'm doing all these things that I know are wrong. I knew that the Bible was against getting drunk. I knew that the Bible was against fornication. I'm doing these things, so I wouldn't say a word. And if I did, who would want to listen to me? I was 
wasn't doing what was right. I didn't have that, that breastplate of righteousness. And it, and, it, and it stopped me from doing anything good for God. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is a huge part of the armor that I think is missing from the vast majority of Christians out there today. There are many Christians, I'll give you this, that they have the truth. They've got God's word. They've gotten a lot of sin out of their life, so they've got that breastplate of righteousness. But they're walking around barefoot. Because their feet aren't shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. They're not going out. That's why, that's why the, this part of the armor is with your feet. Because the Bible, Jesus Christ commands us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. We're supposed to be light, shining in a dark, perverted, corrupted world. We're supposed to be shining a light. Hey, that light is Jesus Christ. When you get saved, that light is inside of you. We need to be, if we want this world to not be so dark, let's help spread that light inside of other people. And that will have a much more cumulative effect of people knowing and even having the opportunity to do what's right when they have the light within themselves. And ultimately, this is what it boils down to. All of these things are important, and we're going to get into the rest of the armor. But the biggest way that you can have an impact on fighting the new world order is to, is to get yourself right with God and to go out and preach the gospel to other people. Because the change happens from within people. We, you know, it's not going to happen from the political process of making laws and passing legislation. The more legislation you pass, there's going to be more criminals. There are more people breaking the law. Because the change has to happen from within. It has to happen in your heart and in your mind. So the best way to fight this battle is to reach the hearts and minds of other people. Now, if you don't do that with the gospel, if you do that with other pieces of information, that's only going to go so far. The, the magnificent and, and incredible power that comes with the gospel is that when someone gets saved, how they have Christ in them, the source of all truth and knowledge. No matter what you tell them, when they have Christ residing inside of them, and the Holy Ghost to be able to, to, to help guide them, that's way more powerful than any other piece of information you could give them about the New World Order, about the Illuminati, about all these other things. Hey, information is great. I'm not against the spread of information, but our primary focus should be bringing the gospel of peace to people. That will make all the difference. And then when these end days come... There's that many more people that aren't going to be taking that mark of the beast. They're not going to be deceived because they're saved. Because they're believers. But let's look at the rest of the armor. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Hey, we need to have the, We need to make sure that we're saved. If you're not saved, you don't have that shield of faith. Reliance on Jesus Christ. Relying on Him. That shield of faith. We know that we can make it through all of these things because we're relying on the strength of God, not in our own strength. Faith on Him. He will bring us through this. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Anything that's coming your way, that shield of faith is there to protect you. And it says in verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Everything, notice, in the armor is defensive. You got the, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, the, the, your loins girt about. The one thing that he gives you for the offensive, which is still defensive too, right? A sword. A sword can be used for defense and for offense. And the sword that we have, the power that we have to actually go on the offense against, against this, it's right here. It's the word of God. It's the truth. It's going to be able to free mind. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, the Bible says. Able to, to divide, um, dividing asunder both soul and spirit. God's word can pierce through people's hearts. In a dark, stony heart, God's word can crack right through that. And when you have salvation, when you have Jesus Christ, when you have the instructions within you, the outward change can then be manifest. 
And you know, if people are wrong, and this is why, you know, another reason with politics, if people are way backwards on their politics, maybe they're real liberal and think that all of these, you know, we should have this gay marriage and we should have all this other stuff and what, you know, whatever. I'm not going to convince them through to become a Republican and that that's the answer. If I could convince them, though, this word is truth. I can rely. I can know that as long as they can continue in the truth, everything else will work its way out. The way that they view politics, the way that they view the world, the way that they view everything else. Hey, if this is their truth, that will work itself out. I'm not even worried about that. That is a, an end of a. You know, that's a result that will happen with this being the source. But if I get the wrong source and think it's in politics or think it's in something else. It's going to have very, very limited results. This has, has a, a, a blossoming result into all aspects of life. This is where we need to be spending our time. I'll finish reading that chapter, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What Paul is asking for here, the apostle Paul was in prison for preaching about Christ and he's asking for prayers. Hey, look, pray for me too that I can have boldness. Hey, I'm, in a, I'm already in jail over this. But he wants to continue to preach. Don't let that even, you know, he's not letting that stop him. A lot of people will be like, oh man, I can't do this anymore. I got arrested. I don't want that to happen again. But that's what, that's what the enemy is trying to get you to feel like. When, when, when bad things happen, when persecutions and afflictions come, they want you to, to be like, oh man, that hurt. I don't want to do that again. As opposed to having an attitude like the Apostle Paul saying, I want to keep doing this. If you're being attacked, you're making an impact. And you want to keep moving forward and just saying, you know what? I'm going to rely on God to protect me. Because look, the more, the more that you do, the harder the attacks are going to come. I mean, I know people, great men of God, that have been getting death threats and all kinds of letters and people sending them stuff, you know, threatening their family, threatening their children, threat, you know, detailing all these things that they're going to do. Which is why you need to have that shield of faith. Because when, when they're throwing these darts at you, trying to get you scared, trying to get you to, to shut your mouth and to stop doing what you're doing, you need that shield of faith and just be like, hey, you know what? I, I can't stop the evil from happening to me anyways, but I'm going to rely on God that God is capable of stopping the evil and allowing me to do the job that he set forth for me to do because he is able So we ought not to get scared by any law, by any person, any politician, no matter, regardless of their authority. We have the instruction right here of what we're supposed to do. Any opposition to that is an attack of Satan. But if you're, if you have the whole armor of God, and you've got the truth, you've got the sword, you're going to be in good shape. This is what we need to do to fight the new world order. We need to go out and win more souls to Christ. As far as our word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us the instruction that we need. God, I pray that you please help us not to get distracted with with too many other means of of, um, fighting this battle, dear Lord, but that we would stick to the the design and the instruction that you've given us through your word. Lord, to to be the most effective that we can be. Lord, if there was another way of doing this, I'm sure you would have told us. If there was a better way to be more effective, you would have told us. But this is what you've told us to do. And and Lord, it makes perfect sense. We could reach the hearts and the minds of individuals, dear Lord. We could get that many many more people serving you. Then um, we will be doing our job in, in the best way that we possibly can, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to open up the hearts and minds of people to the love of Christ and to the salvation that he brings, as well as to the, um, the impending doom that's, that's coming upon this world. And um, as we get closer to the end, end times, that people are aware that the Antichrist is coming and is going to set up his one world government, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.